Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it. Thank you for the revelation. Thank you for your writing in our heart and mind. Thank you. We'll be doing of it, doers of it, and we will see the victory come forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you a number of messages on the subject of conquering. God wants you to conquer in everything. We see in Revelation 21, 7. He that overcometh. This particular word, here for the first time, we explain things. The bottom window shows the meaning of the word, Greek words, and every information that we point out. This means to conquer and to carry off the victory. He wants you and I to do that. And this is supposed to happen ongoingly because it is a present tense. The tense voice and mood of the verb is extremely important to understand what's being said. That means you and I are to continually be conquering and carrying off the victory. What's going to be the result? We will inherit all things. He wants us to inherit everything. And he says, I will be his God and he shall be my son. He expects you and I to overcome. We've talked about conquering sin. We've talked about conquering the world. We've talked about conquering the flesh. Now we're talking about conquering Satan. We've already had two sessions on this, and this is the third tonight. We're going to move on from where we have been because we talked about a lot of important things, and we're going to especially talk about conquering anything that's not of God, especially that would affect you or affect the church. He wants the church to be holy. He wants us to be walking in His ways of righteousness and be victorious over every work of the enemy and have no leaven whatsoever among us. We begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is the case where there was a problem in the church at Corinth. It says in verse 1, it's reportedly commonly there's fornication among you, such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. That was incest. That's a terrible thing. Well, they didn't do anything about it. They were puffed up. They should have mourned. They should have, the guy that did this deed was supposed to be taken away from among them. But they didn't do it. What a mistake. And so, then he said that he judged this matter already, because we do, the body of Christ does judge those within. God judges those without, remember. And he goes on and says in verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit, my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh in order that, this means, that the spirit may be saved. And this is a subjunctive mood verb, meaning that he might be saved if conditions are met. That's not a straight statement that it's going to happen automatically. Whenever you see a subjunctive mood in the Greek, it's always a conditional statement. It's important to understand that that he might be saved <clears throat> in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that he would be saved. It depends on whether the conditions will be met. And what's the condition? Obviously, he'd have to repent, confess his sin, turn away from it, and cease doing that in order to get back and right with God. So, here we see, he goes on and says, your glory is not good. They weren't dealing with the thing as they should have. Know ye not that a little leaven, Leaven is a type of sin. Leaven is a type of sin. And notice it says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Well, that'd be the whole church. It contaminates them all. Can we have any leaven in our life? No. Can we have any leaven in the church? No. You and I are all coming to the place of walking in the way of the Word of God, being righteous, being holy, walking uprightly before Him, of the perfect heart, conquering everything, overcoming in all areas. So here, here it was contaminating the whole group. So he says, purge out. This means cleanse out. They were responsible to deal with this thing. It's a command to them. Cleanse out, therefore, the old leaven. That you may be a new lump. You've got to get rid of that which is contaminating you. As you are unleavened, as what they were, the church is the unleavened group. You can't have any leaven in there. It contaminates you. For even Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us. We even see, as it goes down here, in verse 9, it says, I wrote to you an epistle not to company with fornicators. This means to keep company with, be in fellowship with, mix together with people that are fornicators. But he says, not just that, not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous, the extortioners, the idolaters. Then must you needs go out of the world. And then he says, but now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man is called a brother 
This isn't just for the world to be separate from. This is also anybody that's not right, regardless whether they're born from above or not. A brother be a fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, drunkard, one who's intoxicated, one who's an extortioner, one with such a one that says you don't even eat. You don't have anything to do with them. You can't have fellowship with them or you'll have a transfer of spirits that'll come into you because of being contaminated. You can't have fellowship with that which is not of the Lord. So God wants the leaven out of the church. That means he wants us to all, of course, come to the place of dealing with all areas of sin. And you, we cannot be, and we are not one, who's going to allow any leaven. Of course, we encourage everybody to come right with the Lord, help them, encourage them, make them, help them make the right choices. We share the word with them. But if they won't listen and they have leaven, you've got to do something about it. And they were making a mistake, but Paul came and dealt with it. We got to make sure that we're being a holy church before the Lord. We come to the place of also in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. Here is where it speaks about the in the marital relationship, defraud want not one the other, you not one the other, except to be with consent for a time, otherwise withholding sexual relationship, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, <coughs> come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency, which means your lack of self-control. One thing's for sure, we should all have self-control, and we should never have a lack of self-control. Adultery should never happen whatsoever. A marital relationship is one that's important before God, it's holy, and you don't withhold sexual relationship. Same time, you make sure that the only reason would be if you are coming together and fasting and prayer and agreement on that, but afterwards, then you don't withhold that. It's amazing where I've heard of women and men withholding sexual relationship, and that is a mistake. That is contrary to the Word of God. That'll be a destructive effect in a relationship. We come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Here he's talking about, in verse 6, the things that were given as examples to the intent that they should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, talking about those in the Old Testament. Uh, they can't have these things. Neither be idolaters, as were some of them. It's written, people sat down to eat and drink, rose up to play. They were involved in idolatry, worshiping that gold calf, evil. You can't have anything idolatrous in your life or contaminate you. Let us not, neither let us commit fornication. Some of them committed, fell in one day three and 20,000. Destruction comes because when you commit fornication, you sin against your body and curses will surely come upon a person. Neither let us tempt Christ. Some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. We can't tempt him in any time. And neither, neither murmur he is. Some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Even murmuring will bring destruction. Don't be a murmurer. Don't be a complainer. Don't be a griper. Be one of those who is walking in line with the Word of God Always keep a right attitude at all times. We come to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. As we're going to overcome every work of the enemy. We're not going to let the enemy have place in our life whatsoever. Here we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 9 where Paul said, A great door and effectual is open unto me. God will open up doors for you. But that doesn't mean it's going to be smooth sailing because you have to engage in spiritual warfare against enemies. He said, and there's many adversaries. You have to know that the devil will try to hinder you and block you from whatever he, you, God is working in your life. And the adversaries will try to hinder you, but you have to use your authority. If you use your authority, you can conquer all enemies so that you will see God bring forth everything that he purposes. And you have to understand there's many adversaries that will work against us. One of the adversaries is how the devil will work through the flesh because the flesh is against the spirit. Galatians 5.17, we saw this in the past. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. By the way, it should not be capitalized. It's not talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about your spirit. There's no capital letters here that are just single ones. In fact, all the Greek letters originally they were all in caps. So this is talking about you're against your spirit, not the Holy Spirit. The spirit against the flesh, because they're contrary to one another. When you get born again, you get a brand new spirit. And your spirit's against the flesh, because sin is still dwelling in the flesh. 
These are contrary one to the other. That means they're opposed to, they're adverse to. Your flesh will never want to do what the Spirit wants you to do. You've got to make sure that you are denying yourself, crucifying the flesh, not giving place to anything that would hinder you. They're to want contrary one to another. They are adversaries against you. And when people are adversaries, the devil will raise up people to try to be an adversary against you. Don't get in fear. Don't be terrified about them. Philippians 1.28, in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition. They're on the destructive path. But to you of salvation and that of God, because you're going to walk in the way of the Lord. You're not going to compromise for anybody. and You're not going to be moved by adversaries that will come against you. You're going to follow the way of the Lord. You do pray for them to come to repentance, of course, because they are on the road of perdition and destruction if they continue that way. You must understand also, anything that is contrary to the doctrine of Christ is also adversarial against you. God wants us to walk in the doctrine of Christ. 1 Timothy 1.10 he says, whoremongers for them that devile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, all these people are going to be against you. But says, if there be any other thing that's contrary, opposed, be adverse to, sound doctrine, well, that's going to be an adversary against you, something trying to hinder you and lead you astray. That's why we got to make sure that we are only walking in line with the Word of God we're not giving place to anything that would take us down a destructive path. Remember, in the last days, there's deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils, and the doctrines of devils are rampant out there in the body of Christ. Another thing we must understand, if anybody has ever done anything to you, always forgive immediately. You must forgive. If you don't forgive, you'll give place to the devil. You aren't going to conquer the devil if you have any attitudes of unforgiveness against someone. 2 Corinthians 2.10, he says, To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, I forgave it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Satan will get an advantage of you if you're in unforgiveness. It doesn't matter what somebody's done. You forgive them. You let it go. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Otherwise, we know Satan would like to get us into unforgiveness. That's a way he can get to us and take us down. Because if we don't forgive other people their trespasses, God will not forgive us of our trespasses. We will not be right with God whatsoever. So make sure you don't let anything take you into unforgiveness. Always forgive. Always love, even if they're enemies, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to those that have done evil to you, as it says in Matthew 5, 14. Another thing we must realize is the devil, of course, will try to keep you, your mind from knowing the Word of God. Remember, the Holy Spirit takes the Word, He writes it in your heart, and He writes it in your mind. We see in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in whom the God of this age, actually, the word world is not here, it's not cosmos, the world is the word age, Aeon, he's blinded the minds of those that believe not. And we stop people from believing, but he also will try to blind your minds from the truth as well and get you off into error. We've got to make sure that we have the precise, correct knowledge of God accurate. He says, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ is the image of God should shine into them. Make sure that you are at work to get the word in you, hearing the word, thinking on the word, taking your thoughts captive, guarding yourself from anything that's contrary to the Word. You don't want your mind being blinded. The devil can take advantage of that. If you don't know the Word, you will end up thinking incorrectly. And if you don't have the mind of Christ, you will walk down the wrong path. We are to get the mind of Christ as we put it on through the Word of God being coming to us and being written in our heart and mind. Another thing that's important, we talked about once before, but we want to bring it up again. You need to govern your mind because the devil will try to get to it. 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imaginations. This refers to reasonings, reckonings or reasonings that are hostile to the truth. Anything that's contrary to the Word, you cast it down. Of course, that's why we need to know the Word. So if any thoughts or reasonings or anything comes to you, you cast that down immediately. 
and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What that means is anything that comes to you that's trying to exalt itself or raise it up above the knowledge of God for you to consider that instead of the Word. That's a mistake. That will lead you down the wrong path. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. It is mandatory that you take your thoughts captive, replace them with the Word so you come in line with the obedience of Christ. And you should be ready to do that at all times, having in a readiness. This word means prepared and ready to revenge all disobedience. Because you have to realize those thoughts are disobedient thoughts that the devil's using, trying to deceive you and take you in a wrong direction. And that's going to happen when your obedience has been fulfilled in your life. Taking your thoughts captive, governing your mind, getting the mind of Christ established in you is absolutely imperative if you're going to conquer Satan because he can take advantage of you. And we talked about in the past where, remember, Eve didn't have the word straight and, of course, he, he could take advantage of that and she was deceived and, of course, made mistakes and then the Adam listened to her, hearkened to her voice and did what she said and, of course, here we have the state we're in in the world today because of that. What a mistake. You've got to get the mind of Christ established in you. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 also says something. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Well, you've got to realize it's talking about false ones. Unfortunately, there's a lot of false apostles, false prophets, false pastors, teachers, evangelists out there today that are not bringing things forth in line with the Word. False apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. They try to make them something, but if they're bringing anything that's false, they're not right. Satan himself is transformed to an angel of light. He'll come and people will like appear like they are such. How do you know someone who's true and who's not? You well, know, you've got to be in line with the Word, for one. Also, you know them by their fruits, you know them by their works, you know them by whether their doctrines in line with the Word of God, you know by the things that they're, you're checking out in line with the Word, whether they're true or not. And also, you look at their works, and also if they're, you know, they might be saying one thing one minute and then going and doing another thing another minute. Lots of hypocrites out there. That's a big mistake. You've got to always discern who's the false ones so you don't follow after them or be deceived by them. We see even where there was a problem. Paul dealt with it. In Galatians chapter 2, this is the case here when Peter, Peter was a problem. He was hypocritical. Galatians chapter 2 verse 11, when Peter was come to Antioch, this is Paul speaking, I withstood him to the face. Peter, the apostle, he gets withstood? That's right. Why? Because he was to be blamed. What was wrong here? For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Well, the gospel came, you know, to the Gentiles, they, the nations. But when they were come, the ones from James, these are the ones from Jerusalem that were following Old Testament law still, and they didn't understand that the gospel also came to the Gentiles and were not under the Old Testament any longer. Well, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. He's acting one way with the nations, the Gentiles. He's acting another way when the ones who were the circumcision showed up. Well, that's hypocritical. And the other Jews dissembled. This means to act hypocritically with, likewise with him. Well, they started following him. This is Peter, you know, so he must be okay. It must be okay to do what he's doing. No, it wasn't okay. Insomuch that Barnabas also, Barnabas was with them, remember. Barnabas also was carried away with their hypocrisy. Hypocrisy means one's doing one thing one minute and then doing another another. Saying one thing and then doing another. Acting one way with one group and then turning around and acting differently because of that what those, that group believes. You cannot allow yourself to be hypocritical. Hypocritical is a problem in the body of Christ. We see people that want to act one way around certain people and then they change when they get around someone else. That's a mistake. So he, he dealt with this, of course. 
When I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all. Now, why did he do it before them all? Why didn't he maybe take Peter, you know, aside and say, you know, you're, this is not right? Well, because he did that before them all. It means they all were being affected. Well, that means it has to be corrected before them all because everybody was being corrected. That's why he did it. If thou be a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? He's calling him on the carpet about his hypocrisy acting one way. You cannot be hypocritical and be right with God whatsoever. We have to be standing firm on the truth. We're not going to compromise for anybody. We're not going to act any way different when we're around someone else who may not be in agreement with us. If it, uh, we have to walk in line with the Word at all times. And these were the ones who were hypocritical. He talks about in Luke chapter 12. Meantime, when there were gathered together a numerable numbers, a multitude of people, insomuch they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. That means those people who are hypocrites, they're leaven. They're contaminating themselves and they're contaminating the church. That's a mistake. It has to be dealt with. He said again over here in Matthew chapter 16. That's why you and I have to confront people that are being hypocritical. Give them a chance to come to repentance. We cannot allow it to go on. You cannot be associated with those ones that are going to be hypocritical. Matthew 16, verse 11. How is it you don't understand that I spake not to you concerning bread? They thought he was talking about bread when he mentioned it. But you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then they understood how he bade them not beware of the leaven of the bread, but the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This means doctrine is important. If doctrine is not in line with the Word of God, that will make someone be leavened. And if you are associated with someone who has false doctrine and you are going to be in fellowship with them, that makes you a hypocrite. You cannot allow that to happen in your life. That is so important. We come to Galatians chapter 3. See, the devil wants to get people off the Word. The Word is so important in your life. Galatians 3.1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? They quit obeying the truth. They went back into the Old Testament ways, into the ways of the flesh. It was a big mistake. We come to chapter 5 and verse 7. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth. They quit walking in the way of the New Testament, the way of the Spirit, and went back to the Old Testament way, which is a mistake. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. This is why you have to guard yourself against anybody that's trying to lead you in contrary to the do true doctrine. It will contaminate you. As he goes on and says, a little leaven, a little contamination from sin, will leaven the whole lump. We cannot allow that. It will affect you. You cannot allow yourself to stop obeying the truth and let anything hinder you. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter about their notoriety, like Peter, you know. Oh, this is Peter. Well, it doesn't matter. I don't care who they are. A leader, whatever, you have to stand up and do what is right at all times. We also see over in Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 26. Be angry and sin not. How can I be angry and sin not? It wouldn't be anything of the flesh. It could only be something that would be a, a righteous anger, maybe over an injustice or something. So anything of the flesh, though, because we're, we're told to put away anger, anything reacting out of the human nature, I'm mad about it, anything out of me, me, me attitude is, is going to be sin. But a righteous anger over an injustice is not sin unless it continues. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. That means you can't hold this for long, even if it's a righteous anger. You've got to let it go. Anger will cause a destructive effect. It becomes sin. And notice what then? Neither give place to the devil. The word place means a place of inhabitance. Place for him to come and inhabit you, which would be evil spirits will come into you because of walking in the ways of sin. 
This is why we got to guard ourselves and conquer sin because that's how the evil spirits, of course, come into us and they will bring destruction against you in your life. Another thing, we got to be aware of Satan's tricks. He has all types of tricks, strategies that he tries to bring against you. Ephesians 6.11 tells us to put on the whole armor of God and put on means to clothe yourself, clothe oneself. You're responsible to do it because it's a command to you and me, and it's what's called the middle voice, which means the subject is doing it for his benefit. You put it on, you clothe yourself for your benefit as a command, you're obeying. And how do you put on the whole armor of God? It's the word in you. The word in your mind, the word in your mouth, the word in your heart, the word directing your steps. It's the word that's gonna run, that you're going to follow after in everything you do. Remember, it's the power of God that will come and reside in you through the word in your heart and mind that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the tricks, the strategies of the devil. You have to know that the devil, he's been watching you all along. He knows your weak points. He knows areas where you, he's tripped you up in the past. He has all types of wiles, tricks, and strategies. And you gotta be ready to overcome anything, especially any areas where you've had problems in the past and the devil's got to you. You want to get yourself strong in the Word and know what to do to conquer and overcome because his wiles, his tricks, his strategies, the different things he'll do, he'll try to get to you in the weak areas that you've had. That's why you're going to strengthen everything in your life. We come to verse 12. You and I are to engage in warfare in the heavenlies against all of the evil spirits. Ephesians 6.12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, which really means authorities. It's the word exousia. Against the rulers of the darkness of this age. The word world means aeon, meaning age. Against spiritual wickedness in the high or heavenly places. You have dominion. You know, there's a lot of people that have thought we don't have authority to operate in the heavenlies. It is false. Not true whatsoever. Notice Ephesians 1, verse 21. If we go back to verse 20, it speaks about Jesus, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The Father set Jesus at his own right hand. And so that's in heaven, far above all principality and authority and power and dominion and every name that's named not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So he's in a position of authority over that. Well, what's that got to do with us? When you and I receive Jesus, what do we get? We get a brand new spirit, the same spirit that he has. We're in Christ. Well, where are we seated? Ephesians 2, 6, he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, that means even though you're here on earth, the spirit you have came from above because you were born from above. And that spirit you have, now you're in the same position that he's in, because remember, we live as citizens of heaven, as firstborn. And so you're in a position of authority over all of the principalities, powers, all these ones, just like Jesus is, and all the evil spirits. So you're in authority over all evil spirits in the heavenlies, as well as in the earth. And you are to war against them. That is so important. It's important to understand that you have to use your weapons of warfare and the authority that God's given you to conquer these enemies. Matthew 16, 19 is an important scripture that many people have not understood because they've looked at the translations that don't translate it correctly and not seen the truth. Notice, I will give unto thee the keys. Keys are means of access to the kingdom. That means the rule and reign of something. And here it says heaven, and almost every translation says heaven. But there's a problem. It's not talking about heaven, where God is. Why? Because this particular word here, here it is, it is plural. If you notice, it's the word heaven. It's plural. And in fact, it's used three times in this verse. In each case, here's the next one, plural. And here's the last one, also plural. Well, you can't translate a plural noun, it's singular, it's be heavens. So that changes the whole thing. I give into the keys of the kingdom, the rule and the reign of the heavens. You and I have authority in the heavens. And whatsoever you, 
might bind, actually, because this is a subjunctive mood verb for you who are here, we explain all these things, the conditional, we have to do it. On earth, where are you and I? We're on earth. But what happens when we bind from where we are on earth? It's going to take effect in the heavens. Shall be. That's literally the verb in the clause. Because shall be is not helper verbs for bound as the main verb. I'll show you. Shall be is the main verb in the clause because it's what's called an indicative mood, which means a statement of fact or a statement that's made in a clause. When it says bound, it is not an indicative mood statement. Instead, it is what's called a participle. Now, a participle in, gr in Greek is a verbal adjective. It is describing something about the main verb. Otherwise, it shall be having been bound, or the way you would translate a participle, it's describing why it shall be, having been bound in the heavens, as Young's brings out. Now, this is Young's literal translation that we bring out, because Young's is the one who has translated things accurately and corrected errors that are in the King James and all these other versions, and also brought forth the correct rendering of the Greek verbs and participles, like in this case. So this is saying, whatsoever you might bind on earth shall be, it'll happen having been bound in the heavens. Well, who's going to do the work of binding in the heavens? The angels, because the angels go into operation when you speak, and they will do. That's why we have to use our authority to affect what's in the heavens. And whatsoever you might loose on earth shall be, same thing, having been loosed in the heavens, as Young's brings out. That means you have authority to bind and this is a problem in the body of Christ. Why have the evil spirits been able to operate pretty much unhindered in the heavenlies? Because the body of Christ is not operated in authority in the heavenlies, even though they have it. They can operate. And how do, they get, how do the evil spirits get control and operate in the heavenlies? Because of the sins of the people. That's why they're there. So what do you have to do? We have to remit the sins of the people, but we also have to bind those spirits and loose their hold and what else do we do? We cast them down, throw them down, root them out, fall upon them to their destruction. This is also important to understand. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. We're over them. We're in, this is all fulfilled in Jesus Christ in the New Testament era for us to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, as well as to build and to plant. You are now to get rid of everything that is operating because you have authority over the devil. You are to cast all these spirits down and conquer them and overcome all of these areas where the enemies are working. In fact, the intercessor is to be involved in warfare. We know that from Isaiah chapter 59 in verse 16. Remember, this is talking about in Ephesians 6 about putting on the armor of God. Here it says he saw no, he wondered there was, that there was no man and wondered there was no intercessor. So his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness sustained him. And so what did he do? He put on righteousness as a breastplate, helmet of salvation upon his head. Well, that's like the armor of God, isn't it? So that's the word in you. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing, because what are you going to do? You're going to war. You're going to be releasing God's vengeance against his enemies. And he was clad with zeal as a cloak, because we're going to be zealous when we're engaging in intercessory warfare against these evil spirits. According to their deeds, accordingly he'll repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. That's what the intercessor is going to be used of to conquer all of the evil spirits' activities wherever they may be. God wants you to understand this. And when they fear the name of the Lord from the east and His glory from the rise of the sun, the enemy that comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will set up a standard against him. What does that mean? The word standard here, you have to, in order to understand this again, and if you haven't been around these kind of things, it's important for you to understand it. There are stems and there are moods in the Hebrew verbs. The stems are important because they can have different meanings based on what this, depending upon what the stem is. This is called the Palel stem. 
when we put the cursor over this particular word about lifting up a standard, and you look at the polel stem and see what the meaning is, it means to drive at. That is what it's talking about, to drive at. So the Spirit of the Lord will drive against him and conquer him because you, the intercessor, are going to put the authority into operation to conquer all of the evil spirit's activities. You and I have dominion, and we're to conquer Satan in every area. We don't just conquer him in certain areas. You have total dominion. You are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and you're to conquer every work of the enemy and see total victory. Also, anything that would come against you specifically, the armor of God, not only do we wrestle against the spirits in the heavenlies, but also any fiery darts that the enemy would work against you, you're going to stop them all. You can stop every work of the enemy. Look what it says, Ephesians 6, 12. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able or have the power to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Anything that's coming against you, you can conquer it. How do you use the shield of faith? You speak the word. How did Jesus deal with things? It is written, he spoke the word, the heel shield of faith gets held up to conquer the attacks that were coming. They never, nothing ever got through to Jesus. The devil tried, but he never got through. You can conquer in the same way using the shield of faith to conquer every attack or fiery dart of the wicked one. Another thing that's important if you're going to conquer the enemy is this, your mind. What's your mind set upon? Philippians chapter 3, we see in verse 18, quite a statement that Paul makes. For many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Enemies? People that are born again? That's right. What's the cross of Christ all about? The cross is where something's put to death. What's supposed to be put to death in our life? All the deeds of the body and anything that's not of God. It's all to be put to death. We're to deny ourselves and crucify the flesh daily. He goes on and says, what's the problem? Well, first he says, what's going to be the result of these ones who are enemies of the cross of Christ? Their end is destruction. Now, he says, what's the problem going on? Their God is their belly, and their glory is in their shame, and they're minding earthly things. If you're minding earthly things, are you walking in God's ways? No, because you're supposed to seek the things above, not the things on the earth. And also, if your God is your belly, have you crucified the flesh? Have you denied and put off the works of the flesh? No. We're to walk how? We walk according to spirit, in line with the Word of God. We don't allow the flesh to work. Remember, we make our body our slave, as we've talked about. You're going to make your body your slave and not give place to it and let it work whatsoever. If you haven't seen this before, you cannot allow your body, which has sin, to dwell in it, to run you. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he says, I keep under my body, and I, when it says bring it into subjection, that means lead it away into slavery, make it a slave. Otherwise, you tell it what to do. You don't let your body direct you. Your body is to go along for the ride. You're going to tell it what to do. A slave, you tell them what to do. This is what we're going to do. Who's calling the shots? The spirit, not the body. If you're letting your body call the shots, then you're not being led by the spirit. The spirit, remember, is against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. They're contrary one to another. It even says, if I, even when I preach to others, if I don't bring this thing in subjection and make it a slave, I myself could be a castaway himself. So we, that's another thing. Satan will try to get you out of the spirit. He wants you to get in the flesh. He'd like you to get in a minding earthly things. And remember, as we were referring to, but just to show you the scripture, Colossians 3, 1, If you then be risen with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection, or to have understanding, on things above, not on the things on the earth. Are we to be minding earthly things? No. We need to know the things on earth just to function, but that, that's not what we want to be knowing. We want to know heaven's ways. We want to know, have the mind of Christ. 
And the Holy Spirit will take the, the Word and write it in our heart and mind and bring revelation to us. And we're going to walk according to heaven's ways, living as those ones who are firstborn citizens of heaven. That's where you're come from and that's where you're to live as. Now, another thing we must realize, Satan will try to hinder you. He did hinder Paul. Did he have to be hindered? No, Paul had to learn how not to be hindered. And he did over time. 1 Thessalonians 2.18 Wherefore, we have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Did Jesus get hindered? No. Do we have to be hindered? No. Can Satan do whatever he wants to do just because he wants to do it? We can try, but you and I have dominion. We can resist the enemy and he'll flee. We can speak to every mountain that would try to be a hindrance and it'll be, we can be removed. We can cast out every devil. We, can, we have the total, total authority and he, this is one of the earlier letters you have to understand. Paul was learning. He had to learn and grow in the things of God, which he did. But Satan hindered him at this point. Because he got hindered there doesn't mean that we're to be hindered any longer. Remember, Satan, Satan was bringing destruction against Paul continually until he finally learned his authority and then he stopped, stopped all that. <laughs> no more was he going to do it. Here's a good example of when he did learn to overcome. Acts chapter 13. Here's verse 8. Eliamus, he's one of the enemy, Satan working through him, a sorcerer. So is his name by interpretation. He withstood them. And you go back, you'll see that the deputy of the country had called for Barnabas and Saul, and he wanted to hear the word of God. Well, that's great. What's the devil going to do? He's going to try to hinder. So Eliamus, the sorcerer, he was seeking, stood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Well, are we going to just let him hinder you and just, you know, he's hindered before. Are we going to let this happen? No way. Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him because he learned his authority and he started to take dominion over anything that was trying to hinder. He said, all full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou cease to pervert, will not thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Before, <laughs> Satan was doing that. He was hindering him left and right. No. What's he do? He said, Now, behold, the hand of the Lord's upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. That, dead, that dealt with that guy. Immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. See, we have authority and dominion. We can speak commands, speak the word, and put God in operation to stop the works of the enemy. A mist and a darkness went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Boy, that did it. The deputy, when he saw what was done, he believed, at being astonished at the doctrine. This is the doctrine and teaching of the Lord. You have dominion. You can conquer every work of the enemy. and You are to use your authority against him so he does not hinder you whatsoever. Satan will try to hinder. We cannot allow that to happen. Another thing is he will try to tempt you any way possible to get you off the true faith. 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, he says, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. What would the devil come to do? Try to get you out of faith. Try to get you into doubt, get you into unbelief, get you into believing something contrary to the Word. Draw back, any kind of thing to hinder you. And so your faith, of course, is what's going to give you the victory, remember. The victory that overcomes the world is your faith, and your faith to grow and become strong and to be put in operation to overcome everything that the enemy would bring against you. So you've got to be ready to deal with any temptations. Don't be moved by anything. Believe the Word, speak the Word, do the Word, act on the Word, use your authority, keep it in operation, keep working your faith until you see God bring the victory as you're putting Him in operation and you will see the victory. Another thing that you must be aware of, and this is important for now and the days that are coming ahead, that is, you cannot be moved by signs and wonders and follow them. You do, you're going to be deceived for sure. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 speaks of the Antichrist coming on the scene and he's called the lawless one. Wicked really means the word animos, meaning the lawless one. 
And the lawless one, what is he going to do? He's going to, his coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. He's going to do all kinds of signs and wonders, lying wonders, all these kind of things that are going to happen. You can't be moved by that or you're going to get deceived. Not only now, but also, look what's going to happen in Revelation. We come into the tribulation period. Revelation 13, 11. <clears throat> I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. Now, this is that second beast. He exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them that dwell there and to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He's going to be healed of a deadly wound. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. What are you going to do when you see him do this and fire comes down? Are you going to think, oh boy, this must be somebody of God? No, it's the devil doing this. The devil can do lying signs and wonders. You can't be moved. And deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of the miracles. You follow the word, not signs, wonders, and miracles. It's a mistake. Which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast, which had the wound by the sword and did live. And these people are going to follow that. They're going to give in to that. And they're going to be deceived. Look at it further in chapter 16. Verse 13 talks about the three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of who? The dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, those three. So they're going to come for what are they going to do? These are spirits of devils working miracles. They're going to be doing miraculous things by the devil's power, which go forth in the kings of the earth and the whole world. They're going to be deceiving them to gather them to the battle the great day of God Almighty. The devils are going to be doing all these things. You cannot be moved by anything that they bring forth. Of course, we see what's going to happen to them all. <laughs> Revelation 20, 19, verse 20, The beast was taken with him, the false prophet that wrought the miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. This is one of the reasons why they're going to receive the mark of the beast, because they're going to believe that he is who he says he is. He's going to claim he's God. It's all a lie. And them that worship his image, and of course both of these are going to be cast alive into the lake of a, fi of a fire burning with brimstone. You'll be deceived as well. Do not follow signs, wonders, and miracles. You follow the Word of God because the deception, remember deception is the mark of the last days, and the deception will be great. You also have to watch that you don't get deceived by people that will speak against the truth or speak against those that are bringing forth the truth. Here we see in 1 Timothy 1, he's speaking about Hymenaeus and Alexander. These guys were bad people that were speaking evil things. Whom I've delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. This means to speak reproachfully at, to rail at, to revile, to, to be speaking evil things against. Anybody that speaks evil against one who is bringing forth the truth, they're in trouble. They're railing against, they're speaking reproachfully. These guys got turned over to the devil. Don't be moved by what people are speaking. At the same time, you got to be aware if someone is speaking evil things against another who's bringing forth the truth and they're not they have to show that there's something wrong uh, if they're speaking against them and prove it. This is people that are used to the enemy, and we see this going on in the body of Christ. Uh, you've got to be guarding yourself. Anybody that speaks against anybody that's bringing forth the truth, make them prove it. Make them prove it. Oh, you're saying that this is not so? Prove it. You can't just let the thing slide. You need to confront them. You need to be strong and rise up and confront them so that they, you don't let them deceive you or deceive other people by speaking negative, evil things. Another thing we see is the devil will also try to get you into pride. Pride caused the devil to fall. It will cause you to fall. 1 Timothy 3, 6, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he falls into the condemnation of the devil, the same thing that he did. You deny yourself. Pride, I, 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 me, 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 thinking more highly of yourself than you ought, thinking 
about your, yourself as something, you know, that's a mistake. You cannot have any pride. You must have humility. You must be humble. You humble yourself and you're to be humbled under the mighty power of God by God's work in your life. Pride will cause you to call and fall into the condemnation, the judgment of the devil, because he's judged by it. That's what caused him to fall. What do you think is going to happen to you if you allow pride to get a hold of you? It will take you down as well. We also come to chapter 4, verse 1. And we see this happening, unfortunately. The Spirit speaks expressly in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. What are seducing spirits? Deceiving spirits. And doctrines of devils. Remember, deception is the mark of the last days. And doctrines of devils. What is a doctrine of the devil? Anything that's contrary to the truth. Can we have doctrines that can be of the devil that are in the body of Christ? Yes. In fact, think about it. There are doctrines that are contrary, taught in lots of different circles. Well, if there's only one truth, which there is, what happens if we have four or five different doctrines out there? Well, they're all wrong except for one at best. So you know there's things that aren't in line with the Word of God. Well, we need to expose the doctrines of devils and we need to take a stand against them. Do we just put up with someone who's involved in, with doctrines of devils? No. Romans 16, verse 17. Look what it says. I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned. Well, if you've learned the doctrine of something, and you know it's the truth, you mark those that are causing divisions and offenses, and what do you do? You avoid them. What does that mean? That means to turn aside from them. You're going to turn away from them. You're going to shun them. And is this just a suggestion, a good idea? No, it's a command. Anybody who will not turn away from someone who is bringing false doctrines is making a mistake. Actually, they're in disobedience and rebellion to God because they're not obeying the command. Here's another scripture that's important to see, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. We command you, brethren. Well, that's not a suggestion. It's not like, oh, think about it. No, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that's walking disorderly and not after the tradition, and tradition we're talking about, not traditions of men, but the traditions of the Word of God, which would be the true doctrine which you received of us. So that means we're going to withdraw ourselves from those that are not, if they, you know, you try to bring the truth to them, if they won't listen and they're going to continue in it, you're not to be in fellowship with them whatsoever. Look what it says in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 14. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, mark that man, and have no company with him. Having no company with him, that means you're not going to be in fellowship with him any longer. This word actually, when you look it up, it means have no company, have no association with, have no dealings with him, that he may be ashamed. Am I going to compromise and be in fellowship with someone who's not walking right or has false doctrine? No way. It's sin in a person's life. See, the Lord is going to have a church that's going to walk in line with the Word of God and not be in compromise whatsoever. In fact, look at this statement. 2 John verse 9. Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ. Well, that means he's in false doctrine. He's not walking right. He is not having God. The word hath is a present tense, meaning he's not having God. Well, he's born again. Just because you're born again doesn't mean you're having God. You're only having God if you're having the word in you that you're hearing and doing and walking in line with. You've got the true doctrine. He that's abiding, remaining, continuing in the doctrine of Christ is having both the Father and the Son. Well, that means doctrine is extremely important. Now, what if someone's following a false doctrine? What do you do? Well, you should seek to correct them and bring the truth of the word to them so that they can come to the place of repentance. 
But what happens if they won't listen? Look what it says, a man that's a heretic. What is a heter heretic? That's one who is a follower of a false doctrine. After the first and second admonition or warning, what do you do? You're to reject him. What does reject mean? <laughs> it means exactly what it says. Reject him, and it's a command with an ongoing effect. Let's give an example. Let's say we have a person who believes in once saved, always saved. Well, we've taught recently on that subject. We taught extensively two messages where we talked about how can sin affect your salvation. The answer was yes. We gave scriptures continually in both of those messages showing that once saved, always saved is a lie. Well, suppose we have someone that's involved in once saved, always saved. Am I going to have any fellowship with that person? No. What am I going to do? I'm supposed to avoid that person. I'm supposed to withdraw from that person. I'm supposed to reject that if they will not come to the place of repentance when you bring the word. And these are commands. This isn't just, you know, well, you know, think about it. No, it's imperative command. This is a major problem in the body of Christ. They have fellowship with people that are walking wrong. I'm not going to have anything to do with anybody. I'm going to share the word with them and help them, and I'll be glad to sit down and talk with them and show them all the scriptures and encourage them in the right thing. But if they don't choose the right way, am I going to have fellowship with them? No. I'll give you an example why it won't work. Let's say here's such and such that teaches once saved, always saved, and teaches like all your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future type of thing, which is all a lie. And then someone else over here who says, no, salvation is an ongoing process as we've seen. You are being saved as we brought forth the scriptures. And it's not a one-time thing. And you can turn away from it. You can walk in lawlessness and he'll say, depart. Or you can be in unrighteousness and depart. And there's all the scriptures that we gave, many, many different ones showing that it's false. Well, let's say we come across someone and we're, we're together in fellowship. And we preach the gospel to that person, some, someone out there who needs to receive the Lord. And we're together on this. And let's say the person gets born again, they receive Jesus. What's the once saved, always guys saved going to say to him? You got salvation. You're born from above. Now your salvation is set forever. All your sins are washed away. Everything's fine forever. Well, what are you going to do? Wait a minute. I, I can't stand by and let that lie come to them. I have to tell them the truth. Wait, wait a minute here. And I'd give them all the scriptures showing that salvation is an ongoing work. And I would also tell them that it's not set. And also, are your sins all gone, washed away, you know, past, present, future? No. You're going to have to confess your sins, deal with your sin, overcome your sin, and give them all the scriptures on that. So how can you function together, the two, if you are ones over here in false doctrine and ones over here in line with the truth on this, it doesn't work, does it? And you can't sit by there and say, well, I'm not going to say anything here because I don't want to ruffle any the guy who says once saved, always saved, you know. What does that make you? That makes you in compromise if you don't say anything. It makes you hypocritical because you believe one thing and you'll say that around other people. But around, so, well, I'm, I can't address that here because that'll, that, that guy won't go along with that or that group won't go along with that. Those people are hypocrites and they're in trouble. You cannot be a hypocrite. You've got to take a stand for the truth and do what is right. It is so important. 2 Timothy chapter 2 tells us something else. These are all things that we've got to conquer so we conquer Satan in our life. How about the guy that's against himself? He's made mistakes. Well, you're going to come and bring the truth to him. You want to see him being restored, right? 2 Timothy 2.24, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient, in meekness, never in a, a mean way or a harsh way or a condemning way, but with meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if they're, they've gone off in error. If God peradventure, will give them repentance, a change of mind. 
Now it says to the acknowledging of the truth. It's not a good translation. I'll tell you why. Acknowledging would be a participle, but it's not. It is a noun, and it means precise, correct knowledge. I'll show you. It's a noun. It's not a participle. Here is the word, knowledge. It is a noun. So it's talking about change of mind to the precise, correct knowledge of the truth. Well, what will that do? That'll straighten them out, won't it? I get the precise, correct knowledge. I'm changing my mind. I'm not going to walk in that way any longer. And then what? That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. What does that mean? The person who is off the word of God and not walking right, and now he's in captivity because of sin, He's got to recover himself out of the snare of the devil. Who, that person was taken captive by the devil at the devil's will. That's what it's talking about with him and his, this referring to the devil. Meaning, you have to help them come to repentance, change their mind, do what needs to be done. Now, that's also another thing. Many people think, well, I'll just pray for someone, or I'll just cast out, or I'll get them free from the problem. But wait a minute. It doesn't say that you, the one who with meekness, brought them the, the instruction of what he needed to do. No, they have to recover themselves. Otherwise, you're not, going to you're not going to get them recovered. They're going to recover themselves. You can help them, but they have to do the word for themselves. They have to work out their own salvation. They're going to have to cast out for themselves. They're going to have to resist the enemy's temptation for themselves that will try, because the devil will try to come back and deceive them and take them down a wrong path again. So, as you're ministering to people, always come, remember, with a meekness. You instruct them with the Word of God that hopefully they'll come to change their mind, come in line with the truth. Then you tell them, now you get to recover yourself out of the snare of the devil, which means you've got to have the Word in you. You've got to be ready to resist temptations. You're going to also have to cast out the demons. I'll help you do it, but you're going to have to do it too. You're going to have to stand against the temptations. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get them free if they don't operate in line with the Word of God yourself. Many people have a tendency just to try, well, I'll just pray for them and get them free. It's not going to work. Everybody's got to come in line themselves and work out their own salvation. That's why they've got to get the Word in them and walk in the line with the Word of God. Here's another place where the devil works. And this is where in 2 Timothy Chapter 4, verse 10. There's one that was with Timothy here and Paul. Demas has forsaken me. He left, having loved this present age. The word world means age. He, he's, he left him because he decided he's going back into the present age. He liked that better. This age is run by the devil, the god of this age. You cannot walk after the ways of the world or go back to the ways of this age it's leading you down a path of destruction. He left. He, he instead yielded to this. Well, that's going right back into now the devil's camp because he is the God of this age. We cannot be allowing ourselves to go back to the ways of the world. Remember, we talked about this in the past in uh, 1 John, chapter, 1 John, that is, chapter 2, in verse 15 and following. Love not the world, neither the things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't have both. He was loving the age and loving the things of this world. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. And that means you're following after the way of the devil. This world's contaminated, remember. He's the ruler of this world. He's the God of this age. You must realize that you can't walk in these ways. And he made a big mistake, and it cost him. We see another thing that's important. Sin has to be dealt with in your life. Because if you don't deal with sin, it's going to take you down. This is where they wouldn't listen to him. And back in verse 7, it says, Today if you'll hear his voice, yeah, but they wouldn't, Harden not your hearts is the provocation, the day of temptation, which is what happened in the wilderness. They wouldn't listen to him. They just did what they wanted. The fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works 40 years. 
I was grieved with that generation. Why was he grieved? Because they wouldn't obey. They'd always err in their heart. It shows you it's a heart problem on the inside of you. And they've not known my ways, which you won't get revelation if you don't have your heart right. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest, which is possessing the promises. Now, he brings this over to you and me. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. You could have evil in your heart by allowing any, something in that's not of God. And what does it say? It's quite a statement in departing from the living God. So what is it doing? Exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You must understand that sin is a big deal. It will harden your heart. It'll have an effect upon you. You just don't think, oh, sin's not a big deal. Everything will be fine. <laughs> no, it's a big deal. It's hardening your heart. It's giving place to the devil. It's allowing evil spirits to come in. It's hindering you. When you, sin, when you sin, do one thing, it gets easier to do it the next time, you know. You can't allow this. This is the deceitfulness of sin. And what's the wages of sin? Death. When it's finished, it will do a destructive work. Another thing. The devil will try to get you to draw back from operating in faith. Never. Hebrews 10, 38. The just shall live by faith. That's the way you're going to walk and live. If any man draw back, we're not going to draw back. Drawing back is turning away from what God commands us to do. We're supposed to walk by faith. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. We're not of them who draw back. And notice what it says you draw back into. Into destruction. This is the word apollie, meaning utter destruction. You can't draw back. You're to be, you're to walk in the way of destruction now. But of them that believe to the saving, or this really means the preserving of the soul. Because where's the battleground? It's in the soul. And if the devil can get you to draw back, he's got to your mind and will, and you chose not to go, and it's going to be damaging to your soul. You won't preserve your soul. You'll be on the path of destruction. No, we need to walk by faith and never turn back. Another thing is you don't want to ever cast away your confidence. Your confidence is always to be in the Word of God and what God will do, because He will perform His Word in your life. Hebrews 10.35, Cast not away, therefore your confidence has great recompense of reward. The devil will try to get you to cast away your confidence, you know, and oh, maybe God's not going to do it for me. Some lying teaching comes to you, you know. You know. Oh, his promises are sure and set. Every promise is available for all of us. He goes on and says, For you have need of patience, which means steadfastness. And what is hoopamoni steadfastness about? In the soul. The steadfastness of the soul. Because you've got to have your mind and your will set. You're going to do what God wants because of the word written in you. That after you've done the will of God, that you might commitzo, carry off the promise, which you will. Why do I need steadfastness? Because the attacks will come against you. And where's steadfastness? Again, to show you this, hupomone, where is steadfastness working? It's in the soulish realm because that's how you possess control of the soul by having being steadfast in the Word. Look what it says in Luke 21, 19. In your hupomone, steadfastness, you possess your souls. Where's the battleground in the soul? The flesh has sin dwell in it. Your spirit is right with God and always wants to do what's right. They're contrary one to another. The soul, your mind and your will, the way you're going to be thinking, the way you're reasoning, and the way you're going to be choosing, that's the key. If it's in line with the Word of God and you're yielded to the Spirit, then you're going to do what God wants you to do and walk in line with His ways, possess the promises. You're going to possess the control of your soul when you're steadfast on the Word. That is the key. We're to be steadfast on it in order to carry off the promise. Another thing the devil will try to do is get you to be double-minded or waver. Well, doesn't everybody doubt a little bit? You don't have to doubt at all. Don't. In fact, a doubt comes to you. Doubt your doubts. <laughs> don't believe them. Don't even think about it for a second. Here it says in where the guy is supposed to get wisdom, he's supposed to come in to faith, nothing wavering, to obtain wisdom. 
But the guy, if he's wavering, he that wavers like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Notice what it says next. Let not that man think that he shall lambano, is the Greek word, meaning to take, receive, or take hold of anything of the Lord. If I'm wavering, can I take hold of something of the Lord? No. Why would I waver? God's word is the truth. The promises are sure and set. And he told me what to do. And I can take hold of them. Who's trying to get me to waver? The devil. You've got to realize that is the evil spirit coming at you, bringing you things in your mind. Don't give place to it. And then look what he says. A double-minded man, which really is the word disukos. Di means two. Sukos is the word for soul. A two-souled man or a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Well, why would I be two-souled? Because I'm thinking the word one minute, but I'm also then yielding to something else that's causing me to doubt or to waver. <coughs> that will hinder you from possessing the promises. How about the lusts that come at you? The devil will work through the flesh, remember. James 1.13, Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man with evil, is what it's talking about. He does test you with his word to find out whether you're going to obey, but he never will test you with evil. God doesn't say, well, I thought God was using the evil to try to teach me something. That's a lying teaching, another one of the false doctrines of devils. He doesn't use the, the evil things to teach you. He teaches you through the word. The evil things are trying to take you off of the word. He doesn't tempt anybody with evil. Every man's tempted when? When he's drawn away of his own lust. Oh, that's working through the lust of the flesh. That's not coming from the spirit and enticed. And when lust is conceived, if it takes root in you, seizes you because you gave place to it, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. It will end up in that, in your, it'll call, bring you down that destruct, destructive path. So what are we going to do? We're going to get ourselves, get the word in us, and get our mind renewed. This is where we come to Romans 13, 14. It's important. Remember we talked about putting on the, Lord, the armor of God. This word, put, put ye on, it's the same word, enduo, meaning to clothe yourself. Same thing, that it's a command to you and me with the middle voice, meaning I'm doing it for myself. So I'm commanded to put on for myself the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I do that? How do I clothe myself? With the Word in me. The Word, so I'm going to think, because He is the Word. That's why the Word is absolutely essential in your life. And make not provision. What's the word provision mean? Forethought. I'm not going to have any forethought for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. I'm not going to think about what the flesh might want me to do. No, I'm going to cast those thoughts down. I am going to crucify the flesh. I am going to deny myself. I am going to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in line with His Word. And I am going to see God bring forth His victory and His promises in my life. And He will do it for you. Absolutely. This brings us to another one. Suppose you have tax of heaviness coming at you because of the temptations. Don't crumble in the midst of the attacks. You need to do something about it. What do you need to do? You need to greatly rejoice and get the joy of the Lord that will bring the manifestation of the presence of God in your life. Wherein you greatly rejoice, 1 Peter 1.6, Though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through the manifold temptations. Where am I getting the heaviness? In the soul, I feel heaviness. The attack's coming against me. You know, you're going to have in the, in the feelings, in the soul, in your mind, pressure coming against you. What am I going to do? Greatly rejoice. Why am I going to greatly rejoice? Because you understand what's happening and you know what to do to conquer. It's the trial of your faith. That's the attack coming against your faith. Being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. What is more precious than the gold that perisheth? Your faith, not the trial, that's for sure. Though it, your faith, be tried with fire. Yeah, the devil's after my faith. That's right. 
might be found in the praise and honor and glory and at the appearing or the revelation of Jesus Christ when He shows up. How's He going to show up? With your faith, you're going to conquer that attack that's bringing heaviness against you, that temptation. Whom having not seen, you love. I don't see Him, but I know I'm, He's in the realm of the Spirit. Huh? He's there. In whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, I'm not going to get into doubt or unbelief or throw in the towel, I'm believing the word, with you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. If you don't rejoice, what are you doing? You're going to get down, you're going to get depressed, you're going to get upset, you're going to get overwhelmed, heaviness. See, joy protects your faith. And if you don't keep the joy, your faith will not be operating. You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You're going to rejoice regardless of the situation, of what you feel. And then he goes on and says, Receiving, carrying off the end of your faith, because your faith is still applied, which is what? The deliverance of your soul. Because where's the attack? In the soul. So when the devil shows up with a temptation and the heaviness is there, and your soul is under the attack, emotions, mind, will, you feel this, or it's trying to get you to not choose the right thing, or not think correctly, rejoice and keep your faith in operation, eyes on Him, knowing that he's going, you're going to receive the end of your faith, which is what? Deliverance of your souls. And you will come out of all those bondages, and you will see God bring forth victory in your life. And that's what he wants for every single one of us. A couple more scriptures before we conclude that are important. We also have to realize the devil will work to try to get you to not please God, but to please men. Because if you're pleasing men, are you pleasing God? No. 1 Thessalonians 2.4 But as we are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men. Well, that would be in compromise, wouldn't it? But God, which trieth our hearts. Otherwise, God's looking at what you're doing. Are you going to be a man pleaser and compromise and back off? Or are you going to be a God pleaser and speak the truth? Because God's trying your hearts. You can't be a compromiser. Remember, that's a hypocrite. That's a guy that's not standing up for what's right. Why? Because he's a pleasing man. Probably fear of men, lots of different ways, or pleasing men. Well, I don't want to ruffle anything. That's a mistake. Are you going to be pleasing men or pleasing God? And if you're not pleasing God, what do you do? You've denied him, essentially. Can we deny the Lord in the face of what someone else might think? Mm, that's compromise. That is hypocritical. That is not of God whatsoever. We cannot allow that to happen. You need to make sure you are a God pleaser, not a man pleaser. Otherwise, the devil's taking you down. That's why you've got to set yourself, I'm going to walk and do what God says as a matter. I'm not going to compromise for anybody. That especially comes into play with friends, family, other people, other members of, you know, people that you fellowship with a church or a group or whatever it might be. You've got to take a stand. And if there's something that's not right, you want to, of course, bring the truth to that person or whatever it is. But you can't compromise or you're in trouble. What you compromise to keep, you will always lose because you've backed off of doing the things that God wants you to do. You can't make that mistake. And we're not going to make that mistake. We're going to walk in the ways of the Lord and do what is right. You also have to make sure you're not getting led astray from a steadfast state. You could be steadfast, but not stay steadfast. 2 Peter 3.17, he said, You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware. This is the word philosophy, meaning guard yourself. Be on guard, essentially, is what it's saying. Command to you and me, present tense, ongoingly, you should always be on guard for your benefit, middle voice. So this is commanding you and me, be on guard for yourself continually, lest you also be led away with the error 
for the deceivingness, the error of the wicked. Who are the ones that he calls the wicked here? Is he just some terrible sinner doing evil things out there? No, look what it says. One who breaks through the restraint of law and gratifies his lusts. That means he doesn't walk after the word anymore. He's not following the law of Christ. He's not putting the word first place. He's now yielded over to the lusts, the flesh. That means if you turned away from walking in the spirit and now you're yielding to the flesh, you're classified as a wicked. <laughs> the error of the wicked, that's what they do. Well, you can't be in the same place. What will be the result? You will fall from your own steadfastness, which means firm condition, steadfastness. I've seen the people who get firm condition and then what happened to them? I thought you were firm and established on this. <laughs> no. Yeah, obviously, you turned away from it. You didn't continue in it. You must not have guarded yourself. You and I must guard ourself. See, this is why if you'll guard yourself, will the devil get to you? No. Look what it says in 1 John 5, 18. You and I are to guard ourselves because the devil's trying to get to you. We know whosoever is born of God, sin is not. Sinning not, he's not sinning anymore because he's walking the ways of the Lord. He's going to follow God. This doesn't mean he can't sin. This means he's not sinning anymore because of the work of God being done in his life. Let's back up on this for a moment. When it says whosoever is born of God, is that talking about someone that was born again at one point in time and that was it? No. Because this is a verb meaning a perfect tense. The perfect tense in the Greek means completed action in the past with present results at the time of speaking. It's very specific. It means it happened in the past with an ongoing effect to the time of speaking. What does that mean? Well, what happened, it took root in them and they have a track record continually and that's the way they are now. Well, that shows they've been walking in line with the Word of God. That's why they're not sinning any longer because they've conquered it all. But he that's begotten of God, he's keeping himself, guarding himself, and what? And the wicked one is not able to touch him or get a hold of him. The devil will not be able to get a hold of you if you guard yourself. He can't get to you unless you get place. He didn't get to Jesus, and he doesn't have to get to you. Don't think, well, that was Jesus. Well, you can walk the same walk in line with the Word of God. The Spirit of Christ is in you. The Word of God that He had to walk after. You say, well, He was operating as God. No, He wasn't. He was operating as a man. He had to obey everything the Father told Him to do. Did He have the ability to sin? Yeah, He'd like sinful flesh. But He had to conquer everything just as well. And He did. Well, you and I are well able to do it as well because we now have the Spirit of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. We have the faith of Jesus. We can overcome and conquer everything in our life and walk in victory. Two more scriptures I just said, but I just want to bring the rest of these up to finish this part. Jude verse 9. When you are dealing with the devil, don't be railing against him and speaking all kinds of things. You dirty, rotten, terrible devil. That's a bunch of fleshly stuff. Look at Michael the angel, when Kenya with the devil disputed about in the body of Moses durst not bring against them a railing accusation, some railing against them, slanderous speech. Don't do that. Just cast them out. Command them to leave in the name of Jesus. Just speak to them. Don't get in the flesh while you're dealing with the devil. Some people get all, you know, you have to yell at them and scream at them and, you know, say all these defaming things. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's all fleshly. You just, you see, do you see anybody doing that in the Word of God? No, they just cast them out. They just resisted them. They just do what they're supposed to do. That's what God wants for you. And one last thing. The devil will bring false doctrines. And the biggest false doctrine, probably, that he's brought is the once saved, always saved lie. You get born again, and you think, they told me I'm once saved, always saved. Everything's fine. It doesn't matter what I do for the rest of my life. I'm okay. It's all done. It's one of the biggest lies because people will never think that they can go, 
that they won't stay in the salve, save, saved state. Obviously, the ones who Jesus said, depart from me, you who are working lawlessness after they were born again and doing the works of God. Or the guy who was walking with the Lord and hearing him in the presence of God, and he said, depart from me, you workers of unrighteousness. Well, that meant they weren't walking in the way of the Lord anymore. Look at this one, it says, Revelation 2.15, you ask them also, this is in the church, to hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. What's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? The doctrine of the Nicolaitans was a belief that grace and mercy as a basis of salvation, that man can freely partake of sin because law is not binding, and grace reckoned righteousness automatically without works. Once saved, always saved. They taught the flesh and sin had no effect on the soul because all my sins now, I'm a spirit and so I don't sin anymore. You know, everything's God, it doesn't affect me. And I don't have to do God's word. They believed it didn't matter how they lived. This is the false teaching of today. They claim the spirit of a person is saved by faith in, Christ, in Jesus Christ. However, sin dwells in the flesh and you'll remain a sinner always keeping sinning even though your spirit's saved. They say you're always going to sin but your spirit's saved, so everything's fine. That's a lie. You don't have to always sin. That's, we're spoke, we can conquer all sin. Thus they accept living in lasciviousness, sexual sin, lustful desires, believe that they were still saved because their spirit was saved. The false teaching is prevalent today. It's the one saved, always saved. He hates it. It's all a lie because it's deceiving the people. Who's going to be presented to Jesus? Just the guy that got a new spirit? No. Only the ones that are without spot, without wrinkle, that are holy, without blemish. Oh, that means they must be conquering sin and walking in the way of righteousness and be holy. That's right. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Anybody who is a partaker of once saved, always saved, is going to be destroyed. Boy, that's uh, pretty strong. Everybody's got to turn away from that, yet that's the prevailing teaching in the body of Christ today. It's error. See, now why is that? Because the doctrines of devils that have come in. So what does God want? He wants to conquer Satan. You got to know the doctrines of the Lord and follow them. You also need to know the false doctrines, essentially, in the sense that you're not going to walk in line with that. And all the works of the devil, he's trying to get you into sin, he's trying to get you into pride, trying to get you into unbelief, trying to get you wavering. This is all the work of the devil. Get you into any kind of fleshly negative attitudes. This is the work of the devil. You and I are going to conquer Satan and all of his works by doing what the Word says. The key will be the Word in you that you have in you and you do. And remember, you cannot be hypocritical. You cannot compromise for people or you're denying the Lord. We can't do that. We're taking a stand for what's right. You're going to give the Word to people Get schooled, get yourself so established that you can teach people the truth and explain it clearly so when they hear that, the Holy Spirit will work to bring conviction to them. Now, if they're resistant to them like those other ones, well, there's not a whole lot you can do but keep on praying for them and keep giving them the Word. Don't back off of giving them the Word. But as we mentioned the other day, don't agree to disagree with them. <laughs> we don't agree to disagree with anybody. That's a, that means I'm a party to the division. No, I'm not going to agree to disagree. I'm going to keep telling them the truth they can, and, until they come to repentance. Otherwise, I'm going to be a party to the division. I'm not going to back off. God wants you and I to rise up and get the Word in us, conquer everything of Satan in our life, and conquer all the false doctrines, and be a vessel for God to operate through you to minister to others. The people have to get the truth. The body of Christ has to get the truth because of all the things that we see going on. And he's bringing the truth to you. He's going to raise you up to be strong and mighty. Put the word first place. Be expert in knowledge. Operate in spirit with your authority and conquer every work of the devil. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you. As the works of the devil have been exposed, I see how he works, and I understand what I must do to conquer all of Satan's works. I will get the word in me. I will be a doer of the word. 
I will operate in spirit. I will operate in authority. I will conquer all enemies. And I will walk in your ways. I thank you. I will conquer Satan. None of his works shall, come, shall prevail against me. I will conquer them all. And I will see your mighty work accomplished in my life to set me free. For I will conquer and carry off the victory continually. And then I will inherit all things. I thank you for bringing that to pass. And then you will be my God and I will be one of your people. Thank you for accomplishing this great work because I'm a hearer and a doer of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Father, thank you for helping everybody to understand these things, especially in regards to the body of Christ and relationships and how we can't compromise and be hypocritical or be a pleaser of men. Thank you for establishing us that we will get established in the truth and stand firm and represent you and never deny you and walk in all your ways and conquer every work of the enemy. Thank you for accomplishing this great work in every single one of us as we're hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.